Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to discuss a 1957 Swedish film called Wild Strawberries. What I'm going to talk about, with particular reference to Wild Strawberries, is the way cinema can portray complex human relationships, human emotions, as well as just generally the human condition. Now when I talk about complex human relationships and all of the above, what I'm talking about is moral ambiguity. For a counterexample to what I'm about to talk about, take any American romantic comedy wherein two characters who are just made for each other meet under some sort of strange and quirky circumstance and at first they don't see that they're made for each other but we know it. We know they are just destined to be together. Some second act conflict after they meet draws them apart only to be reunited in the third act and live happily ever after. Or take an action film for instance uh, wherein a threat, an extrinsic threat to our status quo exists that needs to be eliminated. This threat, you know, it's all-consuming, it's all-powerful, but uh, once it's overcome, once that hurdle is overcome in the second and third act, we live happily ever after. Now, obviously, anyone who has lived in the real world knows that this probably isn't how life works out. Relationships with family members, with co-workers, with friends, and perhaps most of all with our lovers are complex and very often full of ups and downs. The portrayal of imperfect relationships in cinema can be unsatisfying for viewers who are used to a movie or work of art telling them definitively how to live their life. But the absolute truth is that the portrayal of human relationships through art speaks to who we are as humans more than the aforementioned romantic comedies, action films, or fairy tales. The portrayal of complex human relationships in cinema has been going on for most of cinema's history, and yet for many critics and viewers it often seems like it is new and inventive. For example, Blue is the Warmest Colour came out in 2013. It's a French film, I would recommend seeing it. However, I recall reading a blog entry proclaiming that the film was bold enough to portray a relationship that didn't end well and have segments of the film wherein the couple weren't actually together. While, as I've stated, I have nothing against this movie, this blog entry still raised my eyebrows, considering European cinema has been portraying relationships in this manner for the better part of a century. For an example more of you might have heard of, Woody Allen has been portraying relationships in this way since the late 60s. Wild Strawberries is one such film about the human condition. In fact, I would say the subject matter makes this film as much about the human condition as it possibly could be. The film is about an old man reflecting back on a life that he sees as misspent, which is something every person could potentially go through. Like it or not, we are all going to die, and if we are lucky, we're going to get old before we do so. Each one of us who gets old will be able to preempt death to a certain extent. Wild Strawberries isn't merely about looking back over a lifetime. It assumes that, should we get to old age, this is something that we'll all do. Rather, the film asks, what if we look back over a lifetime with nothing but regret? What if it's only in our old age that we realize our shortcomings, and by this point there's really nothing we can do about it? I'm going to surmise the plot of Wild Strawberries while talking about, and hopefully showing, how it relates to the human condition. I want to discuss the film as a commentary on life with the hopes that anyone watching this will start to watch films with this in mind. And also, I would like to contribute to the discussion of films as art rather than just for entertainment. After I've spoken about Wild Strawberries, I'm going to talk about how the film affected me personally and reminded me of my own life and some of the dreams that I've had. Uh, this personal entry won't necessarily be analytical, but it still contributes to the idea that we can each extrapolate our individual things from a work of art, and no one can necessarily tell any of us that we are right or wrong for doing so. Now on to Wild Strawberries. The film centers around a 78-year-old professor named Isaac Borg reflecting on how he has spent his life up until that point. Detta har medfört att jag frivilligt avstått från praktiskt taget all så kallad samvaro. Härigenom har jag blivit en smula ensam på min ålderdom. Min livsdag har varit full av hårt arbete och det är jag tacksam för. Det började som slit för bröföran och slutade som kärlek till en vetenskap. Jag har en son som också är läkare och bor i Lund, gift sedan många år. Vetenskapet är barnlöst. From the outset, it is clear that Isaac is a person who studies human emotions as a scientist and has not allowed himself to feel any emotion as a person. Isaac is a rather nihilistic character. It is heavily implied that he does not believe in God and that he has lived his whole life as a detached scientist. Isaac then has a dream wherein he is alone in a town. 
the town representing himself, the scenery of the film changes from a happy old world office to a bleak and lonely setting. Isaac dreams many times throughout the film, and in each instance Isaac's dreams are self-reflective. In this initial dream, a coffin cart enters this empty space and crashes. The coffin falls out of the cart, the cart rides on, and Isaac sees himself alive inside the coffin. His body double or clone then tries to drag him inside the coffin and he wakes up suddenly, and this is where the film begins. Isaac, after having had this dream, makes an impulsive decision to drive towards a location that he needs to get to instead of fly. Now, it's worth saying that uh, throughout the film, Isaac is driving in a car or being driven by Marianne towards a ceremony where he is being honored for his academic achievements. Now, this honor for his accomplishments rather juxtaposes with the dreams that we will later talk about uh, that Isaac has had about his own relationships. Isaac and Marianne then speak very candidly in the car, and I'm not sure if this is uh, Ingmar Bergman's script writing just uh, exposing the way these characters feel about each other through dialogue, but this sort of candid speaking is something that I think needs to be more socially normal, at least in Australia. Take a look. An impulse? Anything else? I don't want to be my son. Yes, he is right. I don't like him. We have our principles. Det behöver du inte tala om. Det här lånet till exempel... Ja, jag vet precis vad du tänker säga. Han skulle betala tillbaka det när han blev docent. Det är en hedersak för honom att amortera 5 000 om året och så vidare och så vidare. Sagt är sagt, Marianne. För vår del innebär det att vi aldrig kan vara fria tillsammans. Och att din son arbetar ihjäl sig. Du har ju dina egna inkomster. Särskilt om man tänker på att du är stenförmögen och inte alls behöver de där pengarna. Mm, sagt är sagt, min bästa Marianne. Och jag vet att Evald förstår mig och respekterar mig. Det kan hända. Men han hatar dig också. Through the dream sequences that also double as flashbacks, it is revealed that Isaac has not been the luckiest in love. In the first dream it is revealed that Isaac's first true love left him for his much more passionate and strong brother. He had successfully alienated his first lover by being detached and intellectual while not expressing any true passion towards her. In one of his dreams, she described Isaac as a sweet man who has to have the lights turned out to kiss. In this initial dream, Isaac is a spectator, seeing things as they were 60 years ago, unable to interact with or prevent the events from occurring right in front of him. What is powerful and indeed gutting about these dreams is that the people in the dreams appear as they would have in the past, some 60 years ago, while Isaac still appears as a 78-year-old man. The events portrayed are ghosts long since come and gone, and yet here they are haunting Isaac in his old age, right in front of him, real as ever. After waking from this dream, Isaac encounters a rather unconventional trio. Two young men named Anders and Victor, and a beautiful and lively young woman named Sarah. The young woman openly explains that the two men are both in love with her. This is a rather unconventional relationship depicted so openly in a 1957 movie. Mm, I must have understood Isak, att Anders och jag killar stadigt. Vi tokar i varandra. Viktor är med som förklä. Det har farsan bestämt. Viktor är också kär i mig. Och bevakar Anders som en vansinnig. Och det är ett genialt drag av farsan. Jag måste kanske förföra Viktor för att sätta honom i spel. Bäst jag upplyser Isak om att jag är oskuld. Det är därför jag är så fräck i mun. Så räcker jag pipa. Det är nyttigt, säger Viktor. Viktor är galen i allting som är nyttigt. Jag hade en ungdomskärlek som hette Sara. Nej, nej. Och hon var lik mig förstås va? Mm, hon var ganska lik dig faktiskt. Vad hände med henne sen då? Hon blev gift med min bror Sigfrid. Hon fick sex barn. Nu är hon 75 år och en riktigt vacker liten gumma. Jag kan inte tänka mig något värre än att bli gammal. Oh, förlåt. <laughs> Isaac and the company then almost have a head-on collision with a couple who then proceeds to join them. The couple in the car argue and clearly are in a very unhappy relationship. They express nothing but vitriol and hatred towards each other. 
and Mary Ann ends up kicking them out of the car. Both the trio and the unhappily married couple are both examples within the film of an unconventional relationship. While Wild Strawberries isn't a direct indictment on marriage or human coupling, it certainly is of the opinion that these relationships don't always make all parties completely happy or fulfilled. Isaac then dozes off again while Marianne's driving, and the next dream sequence contains some of the most iconic images of the film, and some of the most gut-wrenchingly bleak implications about Isaac imaginable. Isaac dreams that he is now interacting with a much younger Sarah, who now sees him. I think in this instance I'll let the dream speak for itself. Now keep in mind this is Isaac now seeing his former lover as she was beautiful some 60 years earlier. Have you seen this in the Isaac? Not that? Then I'll show you how you look. You're a young man who will die soon. Men jag har hela livet framför mig. Titta, nu blev du sårad i alla fall. Nej. Jag blev inte sårad. Jo, du blev sårad. Därför att du inte tål sanningen. Och sanningen är att jag har tagit alldeles för mycket hänsyn. Då blir man grym utan att vilja det. Ja, jag, jag förstår. Nej, du förstår inte. Vi talar inte samma språk. Se dig i spegeln en gång till. Nej, du ska inte titta bort. Jag ser. Nu säger jag så här. Jag ska gifta mig med din bror Sigfrid. Han och jag älskar varandra. Nästan som på lek. Titta nu du blir i ansiktet. Försök att le. Där ja. Hur ler du? Det gör så ont. Du som är professor i meritus borde väl veta varför det gör ont. Men det vet du inte. För trots att du vet så mycket så vet du egentligen ingenting. Jag måste gå. Jag lovar att du ser efter Sigbets lilla pojke om han gråter. Isaac then witnesses through glass his former lover Sarah and his brother Siegfried leading a happy life together. He's unable to interact again and he stands there helpless and I'll just say impotent while watching the scene. Isaac then has two more dreams. In the first dream he is up for review as a doctor. During the questioning he forgets the first rule of being a doctor, to ask for forgiveness. En läkares för, första läkare, det, det har jag glömt. En läkares första plikt är att be om förlåtelse. Isaac then witnesses his deceased wife having a sexual encounter with a brutish man. He forces her into the lovemaking, but it is not rape. She goes for it willingly, and this style of lovemaking is something that Isaac likely wouldn't have subscribed to ever. After the encounter is over, Isaac watches helplessly as his former lover proceeds to deconstruct exactly who Isaac is right after the act, predicting beat for beat how he will react to this news. By the final dream, it is clear that these dreams are introspective and serve to tell Isaac about himself. Det som jag skulle vilja säga mig själv, någonting som jag inte vill höra när jag är vaken. Och vad skulle det vara? Att jag är död, fast jag lever. After this dream, Isaac talks with Marianne about her relationship with his son. 
This indicates a change in Isaac since earlier in the film, she stated that Isaac had expressed no interest in talking about her relationship with his son and it wasn't something he wanted to concern himself with. The film then shows Marianne and Isaac's son talking and it is revealed that Isaac's son is every bit as detached and even nihilistic as Isaac is. Jag var själv ett föga välkommet barn, ett äktenskap som var en frisk avglans av helvetet. Gubben är egentligen säker på att jag är hans son. Allt det där är mycket rörande, men ursäkta inte att just nu bär det åt som en barnunge. Towards the end of the film, Isaac shows signs of having taken his dreams on board. He attempts to tell his son that he needn't worry about the debt he owes him, and speaks in a better manner to his maid. Although it must be said that this is far from a Hollywood ending to a film. Isaac is 78, and by all means not going to live for much longer. However he has led his life up until this point is how he has led his life. The film does not pass moral judgment on Isaac either. It is implied that he has done some very good things for medicine throughout his career and worked as a military doctor during the First World War. Rather, Wild Strawberry shows that the way Isaac has treated those around him has led to him having a lonely life, and that that was his punishment for the way he had acted. Now there ends my summation of Wild Strawberries. If watching this video made the film seem appealing to you, then I highly recommend sitting through it and even checking out some of Ingmar Bergman's other films. Films like Wild Strawberries are some of the strongest arguments for films as art imaginable. So there you have it, Wild Strawberries, a film that speaks to who we are as people much more than any action film or romantic comedy or fairy tale. A film that would rather say, this is where this person is coming from, um, who we all perceive in this way than or he or she is good or evil or what have you. It's suggesting that we're all coming from our own places. Isaac Borg wasn't necessarily a bad man. He was just someone that didn't really know how to express emotions for whatever reason. It's implied that it's due to his relationship with his mother, something like that. I mean, whatever the reason is, for whatever reason, he is not someone that was just gifted at talking to people and he paid the consequences for it. Now, what I want to talk about is the impact that film had on me. And before I do, I want to make clear that films like Wild Strawberries, um, they're going to affect each of us very differently. Uh, and there is no right or wrong way to perceive a certain film. So while a romantic comedy, an action film, any sort of a melodrama will have its agenda that it's going to push uh, where it will say this was the right ending this is what you should think a film like wild strawberries leaves that a bit more ambiguous it lets you make up your own mind it doesn't condescend to you now what i got out of the film while a lot of aspects to the film were highly relatable while a lot of the imperfect relationships in there are some things that are very common um the dream sequences actually spoke to me a lot more than anything else. Um, while I'm exactly one third of Isaac Borg's age, uh, I've still had those dreams where I felt like I am looking through glass, through whatever, some force is stopping me from interacting. I'm just looking at things that I'm not a part of. In particular, other people's happiness sometimes. And I'm not saying this as the confessions of someone who is depressed or anything like that it's just this is something that my consciousness has told me before and I think Ingmar Bergman depicted it very well within those dream sequences um, for example I've had this one dream uh, a couple of times um, I, I was always on the outside uh, growing up I wasn't really with many groups in high school and I have this dream where I'm back there again um, at the formal or something like that at uh, our equivalent to prom and just watching all these dark figures dancing interacting being friends and i'm on the outside of it and for some reason after that i wake up with my heart racing beating and it's not something that i've even been thinking about for years but that dream's just come up a couple of times um over the last 10 years it's haunted me and just like isaac borg uh the idea of something that happened in his past being a ghost to who he is now uh yeah it's something i relate to um and films are great like that i think i'll end it there um i'll end the video on that note uh on the slightly personal note it's actually more difficult to share to a camera than i thought it would be so 
Yeah. Goodbye, YouTube.